Welcome to the Apartment Investor Show, where we help you get smart and invest smarter in multifamily real estate. I am your host, JC Castillo, founder and managing principal of the Multifamily Property Group. And joining me, as always, is my good buddy, my co host, the godfather of lending, Mr. Paul Peebles, national underwriter for Old Capital Lending. Paulie, how are you feeling today? I'm doing well. I mean, uh, we're here in the great state of Texas where the businesses are starting to open up. Uh, my wife had her hair done yesterday and I had a haircut. And so we are excited to try to get business back going. And uh, hopefully we're going to uh, have a, a V shape instead of a U or an L shape in the economy. So, uh, you know, we're, we're excited. And we're excited to talk a little bit about it, but of about two entrepreneurs that have been doing it, I think, since 2012 in the multifamily space. And they're going to give us a perspective of what they're seeing in the Pittsburgh regional area. And it's a little bit of a different area than we've had in the past. But I think these guys are going to kind of share with us what's going on in the workforce housing and uh, just talk a little bit about uh, you know what the coronavirus has done to their business. They self-manage their properties. They have, say, 1,500 doors. And they um, they have an interesting story about how they started, you know, how they're managing these assets. And I can I can probably tell you, uh, I'm trying to cut to the chase a little bit because we're short on time. And this this segment is uh, we were frightened uh, going into this coronavirus. I think back in March or so, a lot of people did not know what that was going to look like going into April and May collections. And I think we've been a, a little bit pleasantly surprised. And, and I may be wrong, but. I kind of want to kind of figure it out from these guys that are operators in a different area of the country of, of uh, than, than Texas or in California or the rest, but up in Pittsburgh. And so I'm going to kick it over to you, JC. Let's uh, introduce our two guests, and we'd love to hear a little bit about their background and uh, what they've done. Absolutely. You know, Polly, we, we talk about it all the time. You know, we, we don't like talking heads, Polly. You know, we, we like to get our data from the experts, and we like to talk to real live operators who are in the trenches and, uh, and making their deals and making their businesses work every day. Um, and uh, these two guys here are coming to us from Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, the really cool thing about what they're doing is they have formed a company that is basically based in Pittsburgh and actually does business completely and uh, mostly in workforce housing all around the greater Pittsburgh metro. And so, you know, we tend to talk a lot about the about the Sunbelt, about the Sunbelt uh, multifamily markets, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about some of these other markets. And so I'm really excited today to hear about the Pittsburgh area, Pennsylvania area, and see how things are faring with multifamily and their world and how they're being impacted and how they're navigating the coronavirus uh, from an economic impact perspective. So um, you know, I want to welcome to the show Mr. Andrew Reichert and Mr. Daniel Croce to the show uh, from Burgo Realty, as Paul mentioned, they started their company in 2012, and uh, and they've got right around 1,500 units uh, under management, and about 120 million dollars uh, worth of of properties under management. So um, definitely, uh, definitely players uh, in the multifamily space. Guys, welcome to the show, and thanks for taking the time. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, JC. Thanks, Paul. Really excited to be on the show. That's great. Well, why don't we get started? You know, the question that we're trying to tackle today for all these multifamily uh, investors out there is, you know, uh, the current thesis around the general market seems to be that the workforce housing uh, sector is going to be impacted quite heavily from coronavirus, given that there's, you know, a lot of blue collar people that are starting to lose jobs a little bit more than than maybe say uh, your gray and your white collar. So, um, what do you guys say about that? What is the data telling you in your uh, in your uh, area uh, against uh, this thesis uh, for workforce housing and the impacts that we're going to see? That's a great question, JC. Um, you know, I'm, I'm primarily going to hand it over to my business partner Dan to to answer it since he's been spending a lot of time with the data. But I just wanted to say anecdotally, I think it's very market contingent. You were talking a little bit about the Sun Belt. Um, interestingly enough, we like to refer to ourselves as the Rust Belt. So if you, <laughs> you haven't spent any time in the Rust Belt, that's, that's kind of our backyard and, and where we operate. And, and I think the multifamily dynamics here are likely a little bit different than they are elsewhere. So um, we're cautiously optimistic, but to talk through why we feel that way, I'm going to hand it over to Dan. Great. Thanks. 
Yeah, uh, it's a it's a pleasure to to be here and get to chat about this today. You know, um, frankly, we were we were right there with the rest of the industry in late March. Um, you know, really uncertain as to what the the coming weeks would bring, um, and we really early on tried to do a deep dive to understand you know what is the actual makeup of our tenant base and. What are the true economic drivers that will dictate their ability to pay? What's the likelihood that they're going to have a, a re- material reduction in income? And I think you know it's easy to paint broad brush conclusions around the workforce and you know particular niches within the multifamily uh, asset class, whether it's you know A, B, or C properties. We're primarily a, a, we think of it as kind of a C plus B minus type of asset. Uh, investor, and well, you, well, let me just stop there. How would you define that? If somebody really didn't know the difference between an A and a B and a B and a C, how would you define a C property up in Pittsburgh? Yeah, I mean, for us, fundamentally, uh, a C property is one where there, and, and it's interesting that our definition of this is is evolving. I think uh, as we've looked at sources of income, but I think. We think of a C property now as one where there's fundamentally a lot of government support that uh, backs the the income stream, uh, and that's not necessarily to say that there is structural subsidy to the property, not necessarily uh, Section Eight or your know, vouchered housing, but that the tenant base, in some way, shape, or form, relies on some uh, government income as a material portion of their monthly cash flow. Um, and also just an affordability component. You know, we think about uh, where rents are in our market, and for us, the the weighted average across our whole portfolio is about six seventy five a month. Um, and you know, on the on the you know lower side of that is what we think of as more our Class C properties, and above that is what we think of as more of our B minus properties. Um, so you know, in a nutshell, what I'd say is we were, we were among those that were concerned because we didn't have the data yet. But the more we dug into what was behind the monthly cash flow of our tenants, you know, we went back and reviewed applications and tried to do just a, a deep dive to refresh our understanding of the economic engines, the more we felt you know, relatively confident that, that we shouldn't see a material disruption to our rent. Um, it, the, the bottom line of our experience is that the second half of the month of March was challenging. So whereas you know a certain proportion of our tenants might tend to be behind and then try to get caught up late in the month, those individuals that were late mid-March when shelter-in-place orders came into effect didn't get caught up after that. And it's you know in our our opinion it could be two primary factors. I think the the, the chief factor is the fact that uh, evictions were halted by our state, so there was no incentive for people who were behind to get caught up. So people who are historically bad actors were definitely bad actors uh, in late March. And the other is that I think that's when when fear was heightened across the board. Um, you know people didn't yet know what the you know whether or not they would have a disruption to their income. They didn't yet know what the government support would be in terms of the CARES Act implementation and how that might uh, impact their you know, personal wallet. So it was just the height, height of uncertainty, and we definitely saw that. So our, our collections, uh, in a typical month, we might collect about 50000 in rent. Um, I'm sorry, we'd collect about 100000 in rent between the 15th and the 30th, and we only collected about 50000 in the month of March. So it was a 50% drop off of that segment. Um, but if you look at the month of March in total, we still collected about 95% of our total rent. So, um, you know, right around the second half of March is when we started to get some clarity around what was gonna happen in the industry broader as it relates to support from the CARES Act. And people started to have a better sense about, you know, what their the likelihood of of um, keeping their job was. And as soon as we got into April, we were extremely encouraged. Um, you know, we looked at our collections mid-April and they were spot on average to where they were all throughout Q1 mid-month. 
So the question really then became, what's going to happen in the second half of April? Is the second half of April going to look like the second half of March? Or is the second half of April going to look more like a typical second half of the month for us? And we were extremely encouraged. We ended the month of April with less people on our delinquency report than we typically do in an average month. Um, so, you know, broad numbers. Uh, we had about 170 people on, you know, carrying some kind of balance at the end of the month of April. And in Q1, so January, February, that, that number was about 185 people ended the month with some balance. So in general, our collections are actually really strong. And we think that the economic impact payments actually help some people remove themselves from the delin delinquency report. The flip side of this is that we actually did see, as you might expect, uh, a, to a, a general increase in the weighted average balance past due. So those, those that you know, were delinquent prior to the onset of the crisis, who then decided they're certainly not going to pay, you know, their balances grew. So even though we had less tenants on the, on the delinquency report at the end of the month, we actually had more delinquent AR than we typically do, um, but concentrated to, you know, a few bad actors who, given the eviction ban, were less likely to get caught up. That's right, because normally you you in in a different time you might have been able to evict uh, some of these extremely bad actors, but now they sort of have to kind of stick around your property uh, in in the in the meantime. So um, how how is uh, you know so it sounds like you know March uh, was a little bit on shaky legs in the second half, but April kind of uh, has been you know fairly close to normal for you guys. What's what is May? What is May looking like? You know, it's it's May fourteenth as of this recording date. What, what's May looking like for you guys? Uh, May is looking great. Um, I'm looking at it right now. So we're actually um, ahead of where we were in any other month this year at this point in the month. Um, so as of the 13th of the month, so our, our cohort that we're using to assess this excludes anything that we've acquired in the last uh, six months. So we want it to be properties that have been stabilized under our management for a while now. Um, and so uh, within that cohort of units, which is about 1,250 units, uh, we've collected more in the month of May and actually materially more. So I'm, I'm looking at about 730,000 in collections um, thus far in the month. And any other month this year, as of the 13th, uh, we've been about 15,000 behind that. So we're actually notably... Uh, you know, ahead of the game in collections relative to uh, a different month or any other month this year at this point. Do you, do you attribute that uh, uh, being ahead of the curve to, uh, to some of the stimulus uh, checks that have gone out to your, you know, your runner base or do you attribute it to other things? Uh, I think it's, I think it definitely does have to do with the stimulus. I think, you know, the reality is for, for people that rent, in workforce housing properties, uh, you know, twelve hundred dollars per adult and five hundred dollars per child. That's a that's a material liquidity injection for for them relative to, you know, what's typical. So, I think uh, we're seeing people identify shelter as a basic need, wanting to make sure that uh, that piece of their financial picture is taken care of, and they're utilizing the excess liquidity to to make sure that that you know their their rent is taken care of. I would also attribute it to um, you know, really stellar risk management on the behalf of our property management team. Um, you know, I tend to operate a little bit more on the um, capital market side of things, and Andrew tends to operate more on the operations side. But I think we're learning that in a crisis, um, you know, being vertically integrated and controlling your operations um, can be a huge asset if you are an extremely proficient property manager. So I think, you know, the, the proactivity and communication of our property management staff, um, putting ourselves on the same side of the, as our same side of the table as our tenants has really been to our benefit. I don't know if Andrew wants to talk at all about you know, what we've been able to do on that front to um, alleviate some of the risk of non-payment, but I think they've done a great job. Let's talk a little bit about uh, looking forward instead of looking behind. What does that really look like for you guys in terms of, uh, you know, in some period of time, these stimulus, stimulus checks will stop. And have you guys thought about, you know, what, what you guys are going to do 
case those tenant uh, tenant income falls, if you stop making distributions to your limited partners, if you stop doing rehab to the property, if you cut back in some vendor uh, expenses that you were paying before, just to kind of you know kind of cash manage yourself through the account. Yeah, we, we've we've thought about it. Um, boy, I wish we had a crystal ball because it would make <laughs> that process a lot easier. But our general assumption is that June is going to be worse. Um, although I will say that we were also assuming that May was going to be worse than April, and we were pleasantly proven wrong. Um, so we're assuming June's going to be worse, and because of that, we're still being very conservative with capital. Um, however we have decided that we're going to make our Q1 distributions to our investors, um, albeit potentially a um, p- potentially a, a cut distribution on one of our funds. We, we operate two funds. Um, and, but, but primarily what we're doing is um, halting acquisitions where, where we've, we've called some capital and we have some reserves and we're just sort of holding on to that capital until we get more clarity on that on the, the June, July landscape. We do intend to move forward with some of our acquisitions once things clear up though. So we're holding on to cash is the, the short answer. Um, we are planning on making some Q1 distributions just because as Dan said, the data that we have today shows that we've actually um, outperformed our expectations. And so I would for, just add to that. Go ahead. That, yeah. Um, you know, p- part of our comfort level there is is due to the deep dive that we've done, and you know, we're asking ourselves that forward looking question, and, and we've said, what are the what's the industry segmentation of the em- employment base and the income streams that support our tenants? And so we, we actually went through an exercise of extrapolating, or, you know, pulling out applications and determining what is the job title and industry of our tenant base of, of, of this individual tenant. And we got you know, what we thought is a statistically, statistically significant sample size to give us a you know, confidence around the applicability of that analysis to our whole portfolio. Then we went through, we had multiple members of our investment team go through and risk score every single one of those tenants, one to five, to say, uh, you know, one, this person is extremely safe and has basically no risk of material reduction to income, to five, um, you know, they should be concerned and this job might not be here in, you know, 30 days, 60 days. Um, and overwhelmingly, the vast majority of our tenants, so we, 46% were in this category one, another 25% or so were in this category two. Um, and we only had about 10% that were in what we put in these categories four and five. Um, and then we thought about, you know, what's what's the likelihood of for those that's in one of those categories, the likelihood that they actually are going to lose their job or see a reduction in income um, that might not be replaced in in the near term. And that that was the analysis that we did that basically informed, you know, May data, May rental data is is helpful, but it doesn't tell the full forward-looking picture. So we had to understand the economic engines beneath our tenant base to you know, develop a comfort level with what we think is going to happen. And obviously, we don't know, but, but you know, that deep dive and our you know, stress testing around cash flows gives us enough confidence to believe that we can part with some cash and maintain some level of distribution and actually even opportunistically do you know, very capital light value add projects. We've, we've started to you know, loosen the reins a little bit um, just based on our, our own portfolio and our understanding of the industry segmentation that supports the tenant base. Can I just ask a real quick question here? You know, we've done some lending up in the Pennsylvania area. But my question is, you know, during normal times, not during this COVID-19 coronavirus time, how difficult is it to get a tenant out of a unit? Uh, Let's say that uh, they haven't paid for a a month or two months. You know, there's some areas of the country, it's very difficult. They're not, uh, they're not very landlord friendly. Uh, how is Pennsylvania, how difficult it is, or how easy is it to get out, get a tenant out of your unit? Right now, it's impossible. Um, <laughs> we, we, can't, we can't evict tenants. Um, I, get, I get right now, but I'm talking about it during, during normal times. Oh, normal times? Um, we're more landlord-friendly than most other states. Um, we can get a tenant out in about 45 days. Um, 
So we expect that to return to normal in July. I will say we're not waiting until then. We're exploring alternative avenues of um, removing some of those bad actor tenants that Dan talked about. There's sort of discussion around cash for keys. I don't know if you guys have heard of that concept before, but yep. um, something that we're exploring is just, hey, can we, can we pay a tenant to get rid of them? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, so guys, I want to be respectful of your time. And I know we're coming to the end of our, our segment here, but you know, if we've got investors out there that are listening um, that are wanting to learn more about the Pittsburgh uh, uh, market and the investment potential there, um, how could they reach out to you guys? They can get in touch with us through our website. Um, Burgo, uh, burgo.com or burgocapital.com. That's B-I-R-G-O. Or they can find us on LinkedIn. Uh, we publish uh, our content there. I would actually encourage them to, to check out LinkedIn because that's where we've been publishing some of this analysis that we've been doing on our portfolio, some of the stress testing um, and the insights that we've gleaned. Um, but but we're active with a, with a digital footprint and they can certainly uh, check out our website or our LinkedIn and, and get in touch that way. Well, that's great. So, uh, well, Polly, what what what, uh, what do you got cooking on your side? What's uh, what's out there these days? I mean, now that Texas on the is uh, side, nothing. You know, we typically do over a billion dollars in loans, but uh, during this this period of time, it's it's very quiet out there. So, if you are thinking about getting into multifamily, I would talk in trying to diversify your portfolio. I would probably talk to these two, two gentlemen here if you're thinking about trying to make a, uh, uh, an investment in, into the Pittsburgh area. Also, too, uh, if somebody wanted to know a little bit more about you, JC, and how you guys invest in multifamily, what's the best way for somebody to get a, get a hold of you? Well, you know what, Polly? You know, we started the show uh, because we just like to help uh, investors make smart uh, multifamily decisions. You know, my company, Multifamily Property Group, we've been investing in multifamily uh, properties for the last 14 plus years. Um, and so if anybody out there has any questions on how to get started in the business, um, how to, if you're an investor that's looking to learn about investing in multifamily, uh, you can go to our website, multifamilypropertygroup.com. Again, multifamilypropertygroup.com. Click on the contact us page and you can request a free 50 minute consultation where I myself uh, would be happy to sit down with you and answer any questions. So, um, Polly, that is what I've got on my side. It's fantastic. Guys, thanks for joining us. I know we're short today, but. We appreciate your time. Some great information about workforce housing. So uh, keep going. Congratulations on uh, getting through these perilous times uh, with some good uh, rental income numbers. So um, keep going. And then we'll talk to you guys soon. Again, on behalf of JC Castillo, I'm Paul Peebles. Have a good day.